Welcome to the conversation. I'm your host today, Rashad Ritchie. Um, we have an interesting fella, okay? He's a former United States Congressman out of Florida. His name is Trey Radel. He's host of the Trey Radel Show. Uh, this guy is an author, actor, journalist, radio and TV show host, and a former member of the US Congress. Uh, he has books that include uh, De Democracy, meaning crazy. A true story of weird politics, money, madness, and finger food, uh, described by Huffington Post as a brutally honest, outweigh outrageous memoir, uh, which exposes how Washington sausage gets made. Uh, he's actually a pretty good guy. His politics are completely jacked up, but we'll talk about his politics <laughs> on this show. Uh, former Congressman, how are you, man? Hey, I'm doing really well. It's great to be with you. We may radically disagree on some things. Uh, uh, but I really enjoy watching uh, you. I've, I've watched uh, many of your interviews, uh, a lot of your uh, political assessing uh, out of Atlanta and more. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, listen, I appreciate that. Flattery will get you everywhere. All right, so let me ask you a question, man, because I'm, I'm reading your tweets, right? And I'm saying, okay, uh, this guy almost sounds like an anti-masker. Are you an anti-mask guy? No, I mask up everywhere. Okay, absolutely mask up. Uh, so, the, the way I look, first of all, I think that masks have become this absolutely stupid object that people are like, if you wear a mask, you must be a damn communist liberal Democrat. If you don't wear a mask, you're a white supremacist Republican who wants to murder everybody. Uh, and the reality is, is I just think that people can make those choices that we don't need the government to step into our lives and tell us that it, uh, mandating that we should be wearing a mask, most especially given the science and data that we've seen after this past year. Governor Ron DeSantis, who I'll never understand why liberals call him, you know, this uh, a Trump humping, MAGA hat wearing, idiot moron, yet. Democrats in this state were clamoring, please give us more executive orders. Please force us to wear masks. The science has shown, the data has shown that mandates on masks or even complete lockdowns really didn't differentiate in terms of, uh, of COVID and the uh, uh, exposures, the number of deaths, or the infrastructure of the hospitals. I mask up everywhere. I'm going okay. to. Uh, so let me ask you this, man. Market. All right, Trey. So, first of all, let me go on record and say you are the first white guy that I've ever known named Trey. Uh, so you get a few points <laughs> for that, all right? Um, let's go to the mask mandate. I got some other things I wanna dig into, but let me first start with the actual government mandate. Because it seems as if many of you guys have a problem with the government saying, listen, you are mandated by executive order or whatever else to wear a mask. And let me tell you the beef I have with guys like you who are anti-government saying, wear a mask, okay? Do you drive, Trey? I do. Uh, do you wear I, a seatbelt? Space speed limit. Right, but do you wear a seatbelt? I do. Okay, um, would you advocate for people not to wear a seatbelt? No, I'd say wear your seatbelt. Right, and are you okay with the government enforcing wearing seatbelts because they actually do save lives? So that's where I think you get into a difficult question, which is no, just that's like a simple that. question, Trey. It, it, but, but 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 hear me out. Look, I think that there's a broader picture to what you're talking about, and it's this: when you look at seatbelts and the way that they were mandated, you could make an argument that well, people started to get educated and started wearing seatbelts and did not need the federal government or state governments to tell them to do so. You know what? Another great example of that is you know, are smoking laws. You know, here in Florida, we had actually a constitutional amendment that said that banned smoking in any public place whatsoever, I don't know, roughly 10 years ago. But at that time, you already saw a massive trend among restaurants, businesses, and everywhere saying, stop it anyway. We're gonna, we're not gonna have this. So the question is about the government. And I'm not anti-government. I believe the government can play a wonderful role in the infrastructure and fabric of our society. But damn it, what I don't understand, to kind of flip this for a second, about, about liberals today, and I'm sorry to overgeneralize, is that when you look 
at the hippie movement of the 1960s, the Black Panther movement, the hip hop, conscious hip hop of the late 80s, fight the power by a public enemy. And you look at rage against the machine, the common thread among all of them, among pop culture and political movements on the left was that, you know what? The government is pretty damn corrupt and we need to find ways to separate ourselves from it and damn it, do something about it. All right, but so today, Trey, listen, I uh, sorry, brother, you're getting, into, you're getting into the weeds and you're starting to bloviate. So let me bring you back to the conversation. This was real simple, man, straight up, all right? Cuz you you got a lot of common sense, man. I've looked at some of your tweets, uh, at least half of them make sense. And I've noticed that you are uh, on the fence as it relates to some of this ideology. You're not all the way to the right on everything, but this is real simple. The science does show that wearing a mask will in fact decrease your chances of spreading COVID-19. And it decreases your chances um, of getting COVID-19. That is a good thing. Nobody argues on the science of that. You're saying the government should not be in the place to mandate because everybody should self regulate and people should basically do it at their will, at their leisure. Well, let's go ahead and apply your logic everywhere else because Trey, I want you to have intellectual integrity. That means that everybody needs to self regulate as it relates to wearing a seatbelt. That means everybody needs to self regulate as it relates to driving over the speed limit. That means that everyone for every rule that may actually hurt somebody else or themselves, they need to be in the game of self regulation. And here's the other point, Trey. I find it quite hypocritical that you guys will say that somehow wearing a mask is government intrusion, but you don't find it government intrusion for the government to tell a woman what to do with her body. Does that make sense to you? My man, abortion's gonna be a whole nother, a whole nother five That's hours. fine, but let's talk uh, about uh, it. Let's uh, compare it. If uh, you uh, think uh, you putting on a mask tray is government intrusion, but you don't think the government telling a woman what she can or cannot do with her body is it isn't government intrusion. Those those things don't match. Either the government needs to be involved in our lives in that way or they do not. Which one is it for you? Where does life begin? I oh, mean, these, right these now, so you want to go there? These are these are where deep do you questions. okay? No, no, you ask the question, Trey. Look, look, look. Where do you think life begins? At conception. Why? Because the child is conceived. Are we really into abortion now? We got look, to be. Yeah, I mean, you 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 kind of went down the rabbit hole. I, I don't. I don't. Okay. I don't. Look, regarding masks and abortion, okay. I don't. Uh, we we can we could if you really want to go there, we can. It, here's where I'm at. I, I, the science. When you keep saying that the science shows, the science shows. There was just a study I was reading today out of Germany. That is showing that even with the mandate of masks, or if you look at California or New York, the mandated masks really haven't done a freaking thing. So I think that people can make that choice for themselves. When we talk about seatbelts, so, so why do you still uh, wear your mask, Trey? If you think that masks do not do a freaking thing, why do you still wear yours? So look again. While I do believe that I'm a rational person here, when I look because at you study, believe the mask does do something, so so I, stop I, saying something you don't believe. No, no, no. I'm just citing. I'm, all I'm doing is citing one uh, article that I just cited some bull. Right and out you of know Germany. You cited some bull because you don't even believe it, Trey. You don't even believe that masks don't do anything. Come on, man. So I wear a mask because, because you believe it does something. Yes, because I believe. That if I'm going to sneeze or exhale on someone, that and in part because of when a private business asks me to, I do. I have no problem at all with the private business saying, if you're gonna walk in here, you need to wear masks. Okay. My issue is with the government consistently overstepping its boundaries. And one of the things that I would cite within the Biden executive orders is now it's all about uh you 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 are you have to wear the masks in any kind of federal transportation, airports, mm -hmm. uh, train stations, etc. And then they also mandated for Ubers and other rideshare programs. You're damn right, makes perfect sense to me. It protects people and, and people listen, who right, make a private right, contract are you going with to each fight, other, brother. Are you going to fight against the government mandating you to wear a seatbelt? Are you going to fight against the government for mandating you to follow? A speed limit, and and Trey, I, I I got one minute left, man. And I got to say this because I'm a Christian. I assume you're a Christian. You're a Christian. I am. Okay, all right. So you you asked the question about where does life begin, and you believe it begins at conception. 
Here's why I believe it begins. If you look at the story of Genesis, when Adam was created, Trey, Adam was not a living soul until something happened to Adam. What happened to Adam in the garden that made him a living soul? What took place? That's God did something. The, the, well, are you talking about Adam uh, uh, and Eve? Are you talking right. about when Adam was created? God did something to Adam that made Adam a living soul. What did God do to Adam? A rib? Nope. Uh, Go you back tell to your me. Bible. Come on, Trey. Yeah, Go man. I'm, I'm, I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> God breathed into Adam, and Adam thus became a living soul. Adam did not become a living soul until Adam had a respiratory function. That's when Adam became a living soul. Brother, I so just want to leave you with that. All right, just think about it, ponder on it. Uh, Trey, how can people follow you on social media, my friend? Uh, at Trey Radel, just anything Trey Radel, T-R-E-Y-R-A-D-E-L. Uh, I had a pleasure. Some other day, maybe we get more time to get into the philosophical uh, uh, discussion of what life is and how it compares to masks. Absolutely, man. I, I will have no floor, uh, no no problem mopping the floor with you again. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, man. Later. What up? Welcome to the conversation. Uh, I'm Rashad Ritchie. We have uh, we have an interesting guy here uh, for this segment. Uh, Ross Benish, author of Rule Rebellion: How Nebraska Became a Republican Stronghold. Uh, Ross is an award-winning author of three books as a journalist and market analyst. He has written for publications such as Wall Street Journal, The Nation, Entertainment Weekly, Rolling Stone, The American Prospect, and Esquire. Um, you got a whole list of resume, man. People can Google you and get the rest of it. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Thank you for that fantastic introduction. Uh, absolutely, man. Um, let's talk about Nebraska because the basis of your book is about how basically Democrats lost Nebraska. It is now a Republican stronghold. Um, I want you to unpack some of that. Why do you think Nebraska is a Republican stronghold? And how does this signal some type of warning as you insinuate to the rest of America? Yeah, you know, Nebraska, when I was born, elected Democrats as well as Republicans statewide to Congress as, as well as uh, to the governor's seat. And now Republicans win handily and easily. And there are several reasons why. Um, one of those is Republicans really activated the right wing churches and conservative churches. And, you know, they used Christianity to help drive out the vote over time, uh, particularly using the abortion issue. And then another issue, I believe, is that. The parties have become more nationalized. And in Nebraska, the perception is that the Democratic Party is you know, coastal and isn't there for them and, and doesn't care for them. And meanwhile, the Republicans heavily outspend their opponents. So if you're in a rural area, what you're seeing is a lot of GOP messaging, whether that's in the church or whether that's in advertising, that really drowns out the comparable Democratic messaging. Let me ask you this question because you brought up how uh, the Republican Party has been able to basically use the Christian evangelical movement, conservative churches to get their message out. Um, are you a Christian evangelical yourself? I'm Catholic. Okay, so you're not, all right. Um, I, I would say they also use the Catholic Church though as well. Let's talk about abortion. Sure. What, which US senators out of Nebraska have actually, actually put up a bill to make abortions uh, illegal in the United States? Well, there's been a lot of reactionary bills to come out of Nebraska senators. You know, Ben Sass, uh, Deb Fisher are both very, um, you know, pro-life or anti-choice, whichever you know phrase you, you prefer. Mm -hmm. I remember a few years ago when um, Governor Northrum from Virginia um, was pushing a bill in Virginia that didn't affect Nebraska at all, mind you, and it, it was um, you know a bill to make abortion more accessible. And Ben Sass went on Fox News. And he, you know, he talked about how this was terrible for America, and you know, we were letting like uh, evil come over our country. And he really rode that stump speech, and um, that's what he used to talk about in his campaign in Nebraska. And meanwhile, that was a bill that didn't. It was a you know Virginia state bill. So that's just like the type of tactics you see is they'll use an abortion controversy halfway across the country to anger people and turn out the vote in the middle of the country. Yeah, I agree with you, man. It, it seems quite ridiculous, but it is a methodology that is utilized consistently. 
And it's fear mongering because none of them are going to do a damn thing about abortion. We know that. Oh yeah, uh, they, they, you know, Republicans had Congress and the Supreme Court and they, the presidency. They did absolutely nothing, right? Yeah. They did absolutely nothing, and they're not going to do anything. But here's what I find really interesting because when you look at the data, you actually have your sharpest decline nationally in abortion rates when you have a Democratic president in the White House. That gives you your largest national decline of abortion rates in the country when you have a Democrat occupying the White House. But I blame Democrats for not messaging that properly and being able to get that out and become a counterbalance to what Republicans spew about abortions. Now, let me ask you about your sentiment as it relates to America needing to take a lesson from Nebraska. In Nebraska, you guys do something a little different. I actually like the way you do your electoral college vote. You all split the electoral college vote, yep. all right? Um, so Biden actually got an electoral college vote out of Nebraska, even though he did not win Nebraska. Uh, and I think President Obama also got an electoral college vote out of Nebraska uh, because of that same split. I believe it was Congressional District 2. Yep, that, where Omaha is. Right, where Omaha is located, right? So you all have five electoral college votes. Uh, the Democrats seem to, to always get one, even in your just holistically Republican state. but. How do you think Nebraska is somehow reflective of what's happening nationally? Because we just saw the opposite of that nationally. Mm -hmm. well, where I think Nebraska is really reflective of nationally is how our state legislature has become so partisanized. So you, you talked about us doing unique things. The electoral vote splitting is certainly unique. But our legislature is even more noteworthy because we're the only state in the country to have a officially nonpartisan state legislature. It's just one house. So the parties aren't officially evolved, even though votes can be very partisan. Mm -hmm. But even though it's nonpartisan, it has become very dominated by Republicans over time due to campaign finance deregulation. Um, we have a billionaire, we have a governor from a family worth billions who is very vindictive against people who vote against him. And we introduced term limits about 20 years ago that um, drove out some of the longstanding senators who had experience. And, and so the parties, especially the Republican Party, became more active in replacing people. So when you look at the local level at the state house and you see some of the uh, legislation Republicans have tried to push there and how partisanized Nebraska's legislature has become, I believe that's very reflective of what's happening nationally with the GOP dominating most state houses. Raj, you're a brilliant guy. What are your takeaways from the research you've done and what Democrats should do or, or what they have failed to do to counter what's happening in Nebraska. I, I think something that Democrats haven't done a good job of in the past is explaining how government already benefits people. Mm -hmm. In Nebraska, and I felt this growing up in a small town, we would use the term big government as if it was like a pejorative. You know, something's big government means we didn't like it, and it had this like nasty attitude, and we would throw any liberal policy away because we would say, oh, that's big government, we don't want it. But Big government is, you know, ag subsidies that help power the state. It's the great education system that our state has, our public education system. There's so many ways that um, I'm not even talking about introducing new legislation. I'm saying like, existing things in Nebraska that are already great are made possible by the government, and we could do more of that and do more great things through the government. And it, it, Democrats haven't done a good job of showing Nebraskans how they're already benefited by the government, even if you know they're hostile to it. Do you have an issue with the big money that you see now in politics in general? Because obviously, the Nebraska politicians are benefiting from this big money spend. Do you have a problem with it? I have a huge problem with it, especially at the local level. Our, our nonpartisan state legislature, if you compare the amount of money spent on races in 2000 compared to the amount of money spent on races in November, it's increased like sixfold in 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely ridiculous. These districts of 35,000 people are being dictated by people in Washington who have you know large purse strings. So it's not good for local economy in Nebraska. When will the message trickle down to people in Nebraska? Because you know, everyday people cannot be benefiting from a system that's so corrupt and antiquated and also connected to big money. Like regular everyday people cannot be, cannot win in that program. Yeah, I wish I had a great answer for that. The only thing I can say that gives me hope is seeing people work together on ballot initiatives where they've been able to pass some progressive legislation like increasing minimum wage and expanding Medicaid, even though you know many of those voters are Republicans who um, wouldn't vote for candidates who do those same things. Um, but when, when that bigger message is gonna get across, I, I've found it hard to be optimistic this year, especially because I've uh, been stuck in my apartment for nine months. <laughs>
Well, brother, we appreciate uh, all that you continue to do, man. How can folks follow you on social media? Sure thing. I'm just uh, at Ross Benish on Twitter and uh, on LinkedIn and Facebook. And you can reach me on my website, rossbenish.com. Ross, you keep telling the truth, brother. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Absolutely.